in Acts chapter number 9 and verse 23. I guess I probably didn't think I was ever going to get back to Acts, but here we are. Acts chapter 9. What we did is we <clears throat> we're looking at ways any Christian can grow based on what happened with Saul, who is later to become the Apostle Paul. And Acts chapter 9 is his conversion, his road to Damascus. If you ever hear someone, well, they had a road to Damascus experience. Well, it, it means it's a life-altering experience. Where do they get that from? They get that from the Bible because it was on the road to Damascus, Paul, Saul, was going to Damascus to persecute Christians, to, to basically hunt them down and throw them in prison so that they could stop preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And he's going to Damascus with that intent. And on his way to Damascus, the Lord meets him. The Lord actually uh, comes to him, shines in a bright light. And after that, he loses his sight. Read the beginning part of Acts chapter 9. It's his conversion. And we looked there at things any Christian can do to grow. And we see that there is, there's prayer, there's fasting, there's fellowship, and then there's witnessing. And those are all things that, that Saul did throughout his whole life. So it's not just that it's something I can do to grow in the beginning. No, he lived this his whole life. These are, are fundamentals, if you will. These are foundational to being a strong, healthy Christian throughout your life. And again, I can't stress this enough that that your Christianity is measured in decades, not years. I know a lot of people, I've known a lot of people that have followed the Lord, seem, seemingly seemed like they were on fire for the Lord for years. And now you can't find them darkening the doorway of a church. And that's sad. But your Christianity is going to be measured in decades. Serve God for a lifetime. For a lifetime. Not just a portion of your life. Not just a season of your life. Paul said, I have finished my course. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness or a crown of rejoicing. Because he served God his whole life. He finished his course. He did everything he was supposed to do. He said, I fought a good fight. I've done what God expected of me. And this was at the end of his life where he's expecting to be martyred. But it was decades of service for God. And that's how your Christianity is measured. I remember hearing that when I first got saved. And I was like, man, I just got in this thing. I haven't been saved for like two years. I'm like, what are you talking about? Decades. I'm like, I'm just getting in this thing. But now I'm coming up on two decades. And I hope to get another two. I hope, you know, it'll be 40, 50, 60 years that I'm serving God. You know, five, six decades. I don't know how long I'm going to live to be. Maybe I'll die tomorrow. I don't know. You never know. None of us ever know how long we have. But if we implement these practices in our life, we'll, we'll, be, we'll serve God faithfully. We'll continue to grow spiritually. So it's good for a brand new Christian and it's good for somebody that's been saved for three, four decades. It works all the way, all the same. And that's what we spent a lot of time looking at that. And now we're coming in to something else in, in Saul's life. And, and it, it's <laughs> the Lord's timing is amazing. I couldn't have planned this out myself. You all know how long I, 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 I preach through things. Really, when we started that last session, the last section of, of looking at, at Paul's conversion, yeah, we started it because I write it down on, on, my, on my outline, on the top of my outline, the date I start it. All right, today is June 29th. This is ridiculous that I'm even going to say this. It's like almost embarrassing that it was this long ago. But the date I had when we started looking at Saul's conversion, the beginning of Acts chapter 9, anybody want to take a guess when it was? What's that? No, it wasn't June a year ago. Thankfully, it wasn't a whole year ago. Were you thinking June a year ago or June? Okay, no, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Anybody? March, February, September. Okay, we're close. It was December 22nd, my daughter's birthday is when I started that. December 22nd. So six months. Six months is how long we spent on that. And so the, the timing of this, I, I couldn't have put this together. Like this wasn't me 
trying to manufacture this. But as I, I began studying for this and I started to see this, I was like, wow, this is you know, pretty neat that this is going on. So what I've titled this message is Going Out and Coming In. And it'll make sense once we get into this. So Acts chapter 9, verse 23. The Bible says there, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So I'm going to back up one verse so we can kind of remember where we were at. It says in verse 22, But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving them that this is very Christ. So that's why we left off with witnessing. And I spent probably like three or four weeks talking about him, about us being witnesses for the Lord. I have no idea. Is it a paragraph symbol? I bet it's a paragraph mark. Let me look. It's, a, it's all right. No, no, that's all right. This is semi-informal here. Yeah, that's just telling you it's a new paragraph, so it's a new thought. Okay. It's like a new thought okay. within that. That's what it's saying. You're welcome. Some Bibles do that. Mine doesn't. It kind of gives you, it breaks it down for you, giving you the thoughts. That wasn't obviously in the original. Someone else put that later. Um, but that's funny that right there is... Mine doesn't do that, but that's where I stopped one thought, and I said, here's another thought we're going we're gonna to look through. So it just kind of, it does that. Okay, so Saul increased the more and more. So he's preaching about Jesus Christ to the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So he's proving that Jesus Christ is, that Jesus is Christ, is the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, okay? Now, and after that, many days were fulfilled. So a long while, the Jews took counsel to kill him. They're like, we can't handle this. We're not putting up with this guy. They want to kill him. I mean, this went south. You know, I call that going about as far south as you can when someone wants to kill you for what you're preaching. Okay, but that's what happens to him. But their laying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, so he goes from Damascus to Jerusalem now, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Now the Grecians are Jews that speak Greek. So how can I put this? They're like worldly Jews. Okay, they're singled out because they've been influenced by the world. The, the devout Jews spoke Hebrew, and you know that's where we're sticking with this. These are the ones that have been more influenced. They're also called Hellenists. Okay, they've been influenced by Greek society, basically, by the world that's around them, because it was a, a Greek culture at the time. Okay, they were that was the, the trade language, that was the, the known language. This is why the New Testament was written in Greek. It was the common language that just at perfect timing, God said, here's, here's when, when the Messiah is coming at a time when there's going to be a language that's going to have conquered the world, the known world at the time, so it's going to be easy for the gospel to get out. Now, all these places in the world, because you go through Europe and everything, and, and even down into Africa and things like that, and they all still had their language, but they all knew Greek as well. Alexander the Great went through. Okay, conquered. We know what he did. He went through like quick. You know, by, I think it was like at age 23, he's crying and, and because he, he says, there's nowhere else for me to conquer anymore. I mean, he went through fast and he did all that. But you can see God's hand even in that because it brought a language that would facilitate the gospel being preached to all these different people, whereas before it couldn't have happened. So anyway, these Jews are being influenced by the Greek world. OK, that's why they're but he's talking about he's disputing with the Grecians. So these are Jews as well, all right? <clears throat> Verse 29, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So now he shows up in Jerusalem, and what happens here? Man, everywhere he goes, this is some, someone wants to kill this guy. So now they want to kill him there. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Why Tarsus, anybody know? That's his hometown. That's where he was from. They said, just let's just send you back to where you came from. Like, go back to Tarsus, go back to your home. Let's let things cool off here a bit. Um, let's go send you back to Tarsus. And then it says in verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. 
Father, we come before you, Lord. I ask you just to help me to present this and, and to teach these truths and that we would learn from it. And God, your word just guides us, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So going out and coming in. Saul just got saved and he immediately begins serving the Lord. Something that really, that, that should be the pattern for any of us. We get saved and we just, we jump in both feet first serving the Lord. Not waiting. He didn't wait. He didn't take a course in evangelism. He just started telling people about Jesus. Now, granted, he had a background that facilitated him being able to do that because he knew the, the Old Testament, which was the Bible at the time, that's all they had. He knew it inside and out being a Pharisee. I mean, he'd grown up on that. That's what they, how he was raised. So he knew it, but now he had this understanding, this insight. He met the Lord, and he's able to start making all these applications. He's like, oh, this over here in Isaiah, this here in the Psalms, and, and, and this over here in Deuteronomy talks about the Lord. And all these different places, he's able, he's able to start just pulling all these things through and saying these all point to Jesus Christ. You, you look at uh, what's the last book, Malachi, prophesies of John the Baptist coming, which is speaking about he's going to come before the Lord. And, and Saul's able to do all of this, and he's confounding the Jews which dwelt at Damascus. He does the same thing. To the, the Grecians in Jerusalem. I mean, everywhere he goes, he's confounding them with the word of God. He immediately jumps in both feet first. This is how it should be for anybody when they get saved. They just jump in. They're just serving God. They're just all in. This is how it should be for all of us, but sometimes there's not a church where people can serve God and grow in. And that can be a limiting factor and that's one reason why we want to see churches started, why we want to have a gospel preaching center everywhere, gospel training center everywhere, churches, so we can help people. So people get saved, they have somewhere to come and grow and learn and, and serve God. Now, as we look at this, though, some of Saul's past is going to cause problems for him and force him to make decisions. Okay, and I kind of want us to just think about that, that sometimes some of the things we've done in the past may be, Look, the past is the past. Not one of us can change it. But the past may cause some things in your future to happen that, that, uh, that at that point are out of your hands. You, you can't control what's going to happen. You just have to go with the flow. And I mean, these people wanting to kill him is one of those things because of his past, because of who he was. They weren't trying to kill a bunch of other people. Now, no doubt, they, they, maybe they wanted to, and we know they were persecuting other people, but we, we notice specifically God mentions that they're coming after Paul. They're coming after Saul, who's going to become Paul. Okay, they're coming after him. Why? Because of his past, because of who he was, because of the notoriety that he had, because of the influence that he had. And his past is catching up to him, and it's going to force some things to happen that maybe he didn't want to happen, but God knew was going to happen, and God used it all. And this is where Romans 8.28 is an amazing verse, because sometimes things may happen in our lives that we don't like and we don't want to happen, but we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. See, God works all things for good. He doesn't say all things are good. He says, I'm going to work all things together for good. And that's what he does in, in Saul's life. Saul might have thought, man, I, I liked it here in Damascus. Things were going great, but now these people want to kill me. So I'm forced to leave. Okay, so his, his past is going to catch up with him. So what's happening here is he's going out from one church and he's trying to go in to another. So he's going out and coming in. What is our response as we send people out, or most importantly, when we receive them? What is our response? How do we respond? Because we read through here, and <laughs> the response of the church in Jerusalem wasn't too good. And I think we can all understand why. I mean, this guy was just murdering Christians. I mean, he showed up to Damascus to, to, to finish people off. It says in, in chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, speaking about Christianity, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. That's why he went. He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter. I mean, if someone's trying to slaughter me, I'm like, I don't want to be close to that person. I don't want to be near that person. I mean, we hear a slaughterhouse and we think that's where they butcher animals. That's where they cut them up so I can get a nice steak, so I can get some hamburger. I mean, that's what happens in a slaughterhouse. They're just 
cutting limbs off and, and filleting things and, and slicing things up. And this is what He wants to do to the church, to the Lord's churches, to the Lord's people. He's chasing them down to do this. And now He comes in and He wants to join us? What? No. And that's exactly what they say. They're like, uh-uh. We're not going to have Him. We don't want Him. So what is our response when we send people out, but most importantly, I'd say, when we receive them? Our response to those wishing to join with our church is to hear them out, to give them a chance, and to joyfully receive them into our fellowship. Let me say that again. Our response to those wishing to join with our church is to hear them out, give them a chance, and joyfully receive them into our fellowship. That's what happened with Saul right here. And we'll get into some of the details of it here. Now Saul had made a major life-altering change, and how was he received by his new brethren? I mean, that life-altering change was he received Jesus Christ as his Savior. But now how did the brethren receive him? See, and, and here's the problem that we all have. Everyone here, all we can see is the outside. That's all we can see. I can't see your heart. I can't see that you're, you're changed inside and Jesus Christ has saved you. I, I can't see that. God knows that I don't. And that's the problem that we have. So this is why our response needs to be that we hear them out and we're willing to give them a chance. Now think about this. Put yourself in their shoes. They're giving someone that, that was, he vehemently hated Christianity, this new sect that had come on the scene, and he was trying to destroy it. He was trying to stop it. See, because we look at Christianity as we know it's something good. Like we know this is God's truth, and this is the direction God's going. This is where God is at. We know that now. But look at it for them as a Jew. This is where God's going. This is God's truth. And now this new thing comes in and is trying to change this and destroy what we followed as truth. So I'm trying to, maybe from our perspective, we say he's trying to destroy the Lord's churches, but from his perspective, he's, I'm trying to preserve God's truth. Does that make sense? Like we know he was wrong, but can we not empathize with him? Can we not understand where he's coming from? I'm trying to protect the truth that God has, has, has given us here. I'm working to protect it. And so that's what he's doing, but these people see him and they're like, whoa, hold on, this guy wants to join with us? No, I don't think so. But he had that life-altering moment that changed everything. How did his new brethren receive him? See, this is what we need to ask ourselves when someone new comes to start visiting our church. How will we receive them? Will it be at a distance? Will it, it be through judgmental eyes? of they're not exactly what we think they should be, or, you know, are they, are they saved? And of course, we want to know if somebody's saved. But how are we going to receive them, if, even if they're not saved, even just to come feel welcome to come visit here so that they can get saved? My wife and I were discussing this. And, you know, sadly, we, we've been treated better by some lost people than we have by some saved people. And what a shame that is. I hate to even say that, but it's true. And I, sadly, I've been on both ends of that. And, and I want to be on the right end of that. I don't want to be on the wrong end of that. But I've known some lost people to be more kind, more gracious than some saved people or professingly saved people. And I don't know what it is. Some people get saved and maybe after a while or something, it's like, I don't know, like they're in their car right before they walk in and they're, they're, they were just sucking on a lemon or something. They come in here all just like, like not happy, just grumpy and grouchy. And I'm like, man, is, did Jesus did all that for you? Can I have a double dose of that? I'm like, who wants that? Who wants that? Like, I don't want that. So 
So how are we going to receive people? Will they feel welcomed? And, and let me say especially, especially, how will we make them feel if, if they can't give anything back? If they have, from a human perspective, nothing to offer. Now, from God's perspective, they're a ruby. They're a pearl. They're of, of great value to God. But from a human perspective, if they can offer us nothing, how will we welcome them? And let me ask you this. If we can't welcome people how, how we should, how God would, why would God entrust us as stewards of His truth and stewards of, of His people why would he entrust us with more if we can't manage what he sent? You understand what I'm saying? If we can't be kind, welcoming to those that he sends already that seemingly can, can, can give us nothing from an, an earthly perspective, why would he give us more? Why would he entrust us with more? See, these are questions we have to ask ourselves. And think about this. Man, we are so full of pride, it just blows my mind away. And, and we don't even see it. Like, we don't even recognize it. Most of the time, I think, and this is all of us, I think we're all kind of blind to this. And every once in a while, we catch a glimpse of it. And we're like, oh yeah, I really am pretty selfish and full of pride. And I think, you know, high, more highly of myself than I actually think that I think of myself. Um, because, look at it like this. Who did Jesus die for? Go answer me. Who did Jesus die for? Everyone, right? Everybody. Now, then that means salvation is available to anybody, right? I mean, think about this. The, 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 the sodomite transsexual that's had a sex change that we would look at and be like, that's disgusting. Did Jesus Christ die for that person? Yes. Did God know that they were going to do those things? Yes. Did Jesus still die for that person? Okay, why did Jesus die for that person? That's right. Right. He loves them. He loves them. Well, some of them go by it, they, them, I mean, whatever, the, you know, that whole mess that's going on out there. But, but He loves them. He loves them. Now get this. This is the crazy thing. Jesus knows every thought, every wicked thought of their heart. And yet he will still accept them, won't he? Now I understand there's a requirement, two requirements really, repentance and faith. He has a requirement for them to repent, turn from their way and turn to him, receive the gift that he's offering by faith, his his his. His death, burial, and resurrection as the payment for their sin. This is the showing of His love. He says, I love you so much, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm going to pay the penalty for you. I'm going to pay your sin debt so you can have all of your sins forgiven because I love you just, hey, I love you how you are in the sin and the mess that you are. I love you just like that. But guess what? I love you so much, I don't want you to stay that way. Now that's where it gets all messed up in evangelicalism today. But God says, no, no, I love you so much, I don't want you to stay that way either. But let me back up from that. He says, I love you. I love that, 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 that sodomite, transvestite, and everything else. It had the sex change surgery and everything to, to, to be whatever. If you were born a man, to be a woman. If you're born a woman, to be a man. Everything that goes along with it. And God says, I love you. Now, it, God is sinless, right? God is perfect, right? And if God will accept them, then who are we to not? And let's back up a minute from that. He's sinless. He's perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. And then there's you and there's me. Now, 
Would anybody like all of your thoughts for just today to be put out there for everybody to see? No, not a one of us. Not a one of us. You might say, well, today was a good day. Yeah, we could do today. How about yesterday or the day before then? Okay? We'd say, uh uh-uh, no, no way. No way do I want that out there. We're, We're a mess ourselves. And that's what I'm talking about. Our pride comes in and, and we're going we're gonna to not accept someone, not welcome them because they're different than us. Because here, get this, because their sin manifests itself on the outside more than yours or more than mine. Who are we? Who are we? So how are we going to receive people when they come here? Now, I'm not saying these people didn't have a justifiable reason for being hesitant about Saul. I mean, he was killing them. He, he probably, likely some of their family members, some of their, their, their brethren had been imprisoned by him. Maybe some of them had been imprisoned by him, persecuted by him, and released, beaten and whatnot. And now we got to just accept this guy because he says, how do we know he's not a spy? I mean, these are real thoughts that people would go through, that would be running through people's minds. That's why I said, though, a response to somebody joining our church is to hear them out. To give them a chance and then to joyfully receive them into our fellowship. I mean, what are we going to do? Let's let's be real with the world we're living in. What if we get somebody that was born a man, started to transition to a woman, gets saved. They've already had some surgeries and now they've made changes that they can't reverse. And maybe they are, maybe... They are still effeminate. What are we going to do? Are we going to be like, I'm not sitting next to them at lunch. We're going to be like that? Here's a real good time to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? It's a real good time to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Because the, the, the ungodly loose woman at the well that he met that had, was sleeping around and had five husbands and the man she was with now wasn't her husband. He's, he, she's the reason he went to Samaria when Jews did not travel to Samaria. They would travel farther to avoid Samaria. But he said, no, we must needs go to Samaria. Why? Because there's a woman there that needs salvation. I've got to meet her. She's a mess. She's morally in this world, in this world's eyes, she's looked down upon. She went to get water at, at the middle of the day when all of the women went in the morning. Why? Because she wasn't accepted. That's why she went in the middle of the day, hottest time of the day. That's when she went when no one else was there. Because she wasn't accepted by society at the time. But Jesus said, I'm going because i got to meet her. Huh, so if Jesus is willing to accept people, what are we going to do? See, don't let your pride get in the way now. You see what I'm talking about? How are we going to receive people? The Bible is so practical, isn't it? The Bible is just such a practical book. Because most of the, pretty much, you know, 99.9% of the church in Jerusalem failed right here. Okay, they failed. I I have gotten so far off my notes, but we're getting most of it anyway. And and I hope it's a help to us. But, But look at it here. It says, so, verse 24, but they laying await. Their laying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. Well, we know disciples are church members, so he wants to join himself to the church in Jerusalem. That's what he wants to do. He wants to do that. He essayed to join himself with them. Look at it, what it says. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. They didn't believe him. They said, nope, you're not. We don't believe you. No. You can't join. That's how they received him. But, God's butts are always so good. When he puts them in the Bible, pay attention to them. Okay, verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way (coughs) and that he had spoken to him. And how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. 
And then it says in verse 28, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Something changed. What was it? It was a Barnabas. His name means the son of consolation. <clears throat> There's only one negative thing I think that I've, that I've found in the Bible about Barnabas, and that's when he gets carried away with Peter's dissimulation and, and with the, the, the Jewish Gentile question. And You can read about it in Galatians if you want to. That's the only negative thing I've seen about Barnabas. Other than that, everything's positive. He was a blessing throughout the Bible. He was a, a, an exhorter. He'd come alongside and help people, encourage people. And you're going to see later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11, he's the one that goes again and gets Saul and brings him up to the church in Antioch. And it's from there, it's, it's Barnabas and Saul, and it turns into Sar uh, Paul and Barnabas, and then they end up splitting because of a disagreement that they have, and the Lord uses both of them. And he continues to use Barnabas, and Paul, in my opinion, was wrong in them splitting up, but that's a different sermon. But anyway, Barnabas... But Barnabas took him. Now stop right there. Barnabas took him. What does that mean? Does it mean he just walked up and just grabbed him and just said, here, you guys need to accept him? Yes, he accepted him, but what's implied in all of that took him? It's what I'm saying we need to do. Someone joining our church, we need to hear them out and give them a chance. That's what Barnabas did. Someone wanted to join the church and he went to him, he heard him out, and he gave him a chance. He questioned him. He asked him. He said, what happened? Tell me. Tell me your story. Tell me your testimony. Why are you here with us now when before you wanted to kill us? You were trying to throw us in prison. What happened? And he listened to him. He heard what he had to say. He didn't just judge him based on his past. Hey, do you want to continually be judged based on your past? Do you want to continually be judged on the mistakes you made last week, last month, last year, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Do you want that to continually label you as what you are and you can never get past it? No, either did Saul. And Barnabas was the only person in that church willing to listen to him. He was the only one. But Barnabas took him. So he hears him out. He gives him a chance, and then what does he do? He says, and, and it says, and he brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas comes and he says, no, we need to hear this guy. Hear him out, and he recommends him. He's saying, yes, listen to what he has to say. Listen to him. He's good. He's a brother. He was baptized by... Uh, Man, Ananias, they're in Damascus. He was a part of that church. He spent likely three years with them when it says, um, verse 23, and after many days were fulfilled, if you cross-reference that with Galatians 1, 15 to 19, it was likely three years. He was three years there, and, and different people have different opinions of that. But he was many days, I take it to be three years he was there with the church in Damascus, and then he comes here, and, and Barnabas said, okay, let's hear it out. And he takes him and he says, look, we give this guy a chance. Listen to what, he, what happened to him. He saw the Lord in the way and he preached boldly there in Damascus. He was, he was run off because they wanted to kill him. That's why he's here. See, circumstances outside of his control because of his past brought him here. He left that church, not necessarily because he wanted to, he had to. He would have stayed there. But he had to leave. And he comes here and he's wanting to join with us now. And none of you are hearing him out. Listen to what he has to say. And then look at that. After Barnabas stands up and, 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 and gives a, a, a commendation of him, a recommendation of him, then verse 28 says, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Now they accepted him. So they originally, he, was, he, he said, hey, I want to join myself to this church. And what they do? They voted no. They said, no, -uh. we, they didn't believe him. They said, no, you're not coming. You're not going to be a part of this. That's what happened. That's what we read in verse um, 26. It says, but they were all afraid of him, who? The disciples in Jerusalem, and believed not that he was a disciple. He wanted to join with them, right? It said he essayed to join himself with the, the disciples at, in Jerusalem. And they said, no, we don't believe you. We don't believe you're saved. We don't believe you're following the Lord. We don't believe none of it. We don't believe it. 
They said no. And then Barnabas shows up, talks to him, actually listens to him, hears him out, gives him a chance, and then he says, why aren't we receiving him? Look, here's why he's here. He wants to be a part of us. He wants to serve the Lord. Why aren't we letting him? And he's then with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So coming in and going out. He's leaving one church and he's coming into another church. That's what's happening. And it was because of Barnabas standing up for him, recommending him, hearing him out, listening to him. And by the way, this idea right here, and there's other places in the scripture you could say, this is where a letter of transfer comes from, a letter of recommendation, if you will, from one church to another. This is where it comes from, from this type of stuff. From this right here. This is another brother saying, hey, he's legit. We need to receive him. It's a commendation. That's what's going on right here. And then they do. And he now, after that, he's with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So he joins the church in Jerusalem. And then as we see later, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So then the same thing happens here. He gets, he gets in, he starts serving God. He speaks boldly in the name of the Lord. He disputes with the Grecians, but now they want to kill him. Why? He had a testimony there in Jerusalem. They knew who he was. His old life's coming back to haunt him again. Okay, he was a Pharisee. How could you turn your back on us? Think about how angry they would be. Think about the Sanhedrin. He was most likely on his way to be a part of the Sanhedrin, that great council. He was probably going to be a part of that. He was, he was about 30 years old when he got saved. It's been maybe a few years, so he's still not old enough. You couldn't be a part of the Sanhedrin until you were 40. You had to be married, and you had to have children. Okay? So he was likely going to be a part of the Sanhedrin. He already was a Pharisee. And now he's turned their back on them. He was probably the one telling them, like, we got to be against these guys. And they probably brought it up to him. And he says, he just disputed with them from the word of God and showed them how he was wrong before and how they're wrong now. And it, it just, they hated him so much, they wanted to kill him. And this is what's happening. So verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And then because of that, the churches had rest throughout all Judea. So it kind of got the target off of their back because Saul is gone now. <clears throat> so they had rest throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There's a lot more that I may say on this. I may come back to it. I don't know if I will or not. But look, how are we responding when somebody wants to join our church, when somebody visits our church? What are we doing? How are we receiving them? What's our attitude towards them? Are we standoffish or are we welcoming? Say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. It's good to have you here. Thanks for visiting with us. Or are we just like, hey, nice to meet you. And then we just kind of see what attitude are we giving off? Are we making people feel welcomed? Because that's what we want. We want to help them with that. We want to help them come and want to be a part of this and, and give them a hearing, give them a chance. So, all of us need to strive to make all visitors feel welcomed because we don't know what anyone's facing at that moment in their life. Like, look, think about this. Saul was running for his life. And if he was married, his wife said, forget you. I can't believe you did this. Because later on, he says, as he's recommending to others, he says, I would that you even were, were as I, and I think it's in 2 Corinthians, and remain single is basically what he says. Don't get married. So if he did have a wife, she left him. She left him. <coughs> and he said, stay single, single like I am, because then you don't have the the weight and concern of, of having a wife and a family that you have to think about them too, you can fully dedicate yourself to God. He says, but if you can't, you know, if you're going to burn in your passion and basically commit fornication, he says, get married. Don't do that. Just get married. Well, that's for most people, by the way. Most people should probably get married. There's very few that can remain single, a eunuch all their life and never get married. But God does have that for some people. Most people know. Okay, but, you know, that's for each individual to figure out and to decide. <clears throat> so 
So Saul had lost everybody in his life. Every friend he had turned their back on him. And now the, the church that he was at, the brethren that he did have there, they said, you got to go, they're going to kill you. And the first chance they got, they, they snuck him out of the wall of the city at night, letting him down in a basket. I mean, that's how bad it was. He couldn't even go out the city gates. He had to be snuck out in the middle of the night and let out in a basket. And then he shows up in this new city, a place where likely he had persecuted some of the people. Maybe he had killed, you know, a lady's husband, imprisoned him. Maybe he was still in prison, being beaten, tortured, whatever. Who knows what's happening? Some of the children in the church, their father's not there anymore. Their mother's not there because of him. And he's going there. And he has nobody. And he's running for his life. See, when somebody walks through those doors, we don't know what they're going through. People put on a brave face when they go places, but we don't know what's going on inside. We don't know what they're facing. We don't know how the Lord's been working in their heart. We don't know. Maybe they are saved and they've gotten away from the Lord. We have no clue what's going on. We have no clue what's happening. And since we're not God, then how should we receive them? Joyfully. Kindly. Mercifully. Just try and help them. Look at it as a gift that God is sending someone here because that was us at one point. At one point, we needed salvation. That was you, even if you got saved when you were young. At one point, that was you. You walked into church and you were lost and you needed Jesus Christ. And thank God there were people there that welcomed you, that received you. And we think, well, we can't have a bunch of lost people in our church. Why not? We have a bunch of children in our church that aren't saved. If, if you have children, you know, in churches, there's, when there's young children, they're not saved, but they get to come every week. Matter of fact, we want them to come every week so they can hear the gospel so they can get saved one day. So what's wrong if it's an adult coming and showing up? I don't care if someone comes for 10 years. If they want to be here, as long as they're not causing problems, please come. Be here. Hear the word of God. Hear the gospel. Because that's your best chance to get saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then I want you to get saved. I want you to come. Just because someone's visiting here doesn't mean they're a member. We're obviously not going to let someone join if we know they're lost. We can't. Biblically, we can't do that. Now, can, can they... And, and I won't even say, I don't think people even do it deceptively. I know that there's, that's a possibility. But we've had people that were here, members who were lost, but they thought they were saved. They didn't do it deceptively. And thank God, his, his light, the gospel light shined on them and revealed to them their lost nature and that they needed Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they weren't too proud to get saved, and they got saved. Even though everybody already thought they were saved. They got saved. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Amen. So we might have that again. But if we look at someone's life and it looks like they're saved and Jesus has changed them and they're striving to follow Him and not one of us is perfect, but they, they want to be a disciple and they're working at following Him and they don't have anything barring them. I mean, they're not living in sin or something like that or, or anything that would cause us to have to immediately exercise church discipline. Then why not let them join? Because guess what? You're not perfect and neither am I. And we're all growing and we're all working on ourselves and we're all striving to, to serve the Lord. We're striving to walk in the light of His Word. Why not receive them? Why not? We should desire to have them here, to help them. This is why God's left us here. This is why He left you here, is to help people. To help people. You're here to help people. So that's your job, preacher. No, it's your job too. It's every one of our jobs here is to help people. To point people to Jesus. To lighten their life with the Word of God. To help them, to encourage them when they're down, when they're hurting. And it doesn't always mean we're trying to give them the gospel right then and there. Sometimes it just means we're trying to be a friend. A genuine, real friend. Why? Because I care. Because I care. Because you care. And yes, ultimately because you care about their soul. But because I care about you right now, can I help you right now? I just want to help you now. Maybe we never see you again. I don't know. 
But if I can help you right now, I want to help you right now. So how are we receiving people? 